start with your introduction. So our next speaker is Shruti Bhardwaj. He's the strategic and technical advisor for the data science and AI group at Novartis. Dr. Bhardwaj has over 15 years of experience bridging the gap and connecting healthcare, life sciences, and artificial intelligence. Prior to joining Novartis, Shruti served as a senior scientist at Biogen and at Thomson Reuters within the IP and science division. She received her PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Florida and continued her research as a postdoctoral fellow at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Shruti has been interested and involved in utilizing AI and machine learning approaches in pharma. She has a patent that involves machine learning approaches to predict the onset of colon cancer in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. She has won several NIH grants that supported her research in leveraging AI approaches in healthcare. Hello, Shruti. She has published several research articles, book chapters, and abstracts that focus on AI approaches in diagnosis and drug development. Shruti, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Devanu. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you for the organizers. I mean, uh, for really, you know, getting this done in, you know, despite the pandemic. So thank you, everyone. Let me quickly share my screen. So today's talk essentially is going to be um, a couple of things. So it's um, my journey within Novartis or even prior to Novartis and just how I see how what my views are in terms of where data science and AI is within the healthcare or life sciences domain. And Demanu mentioned I am currently the strategic and technical advisor within the data science and AI team here at Novartis. And like I mentioned, today's talk will cover the advanced analytics driving innovation within healthcare and especially focusing on the data science and AI parts of it. So in terms of the agenda for this talk, I think I can categorize this into three pillars, three steps the why, the how, and the what next. Why is essentially, why is there a current need to be discussing this right now? What are the things that are making us rethink and transform the way we work? And how are we going um, about transforming how we do business, especially within Novartis, just in pharmaceutical industry as a whole? And finally, what is it that we see as the future? of data science and AI within the pharmaceutical domain. Where do we go next after where we are now? So one of the first things that comes to mind when I think about data science and AI is why are we doing this now? So the simple answer that you know, we've all been trying to figure out is there are three things and you see that on the screen in front of you. I call these the three pillars uh, on which this new way of thinking, this, this transformative way of uh, doing business today uh, stands on. So as you may have already heard from other speakers today, so we're in a world where big data rules, right? So everything we see, especially within healthcare, especially within pharmaceutical industry is big data. Now, it, it, it used to be one of those buzzwords, but right now it's not a buzzword anymore. It is the reality. It is the reality that we see every day. With this big data comes powerful algorithms. So there's so much data, and you'll see that in my next slide, that you need very powerful algorithms to even begin to understand what this data is trying to tell us. And we have massive, massive giants like the Microsofts or, or the Amazon that, you know, that provide us with this compute capability that we need for these powerful algorithms to run the big data on. So these are the three intertwined pillars that essentially make all of this happen. So when I think about healthcare data sources, we have a tremendous amount of data sources, very, very different kinds of data sources. It could be omics, which we have been working with for ages. It could be more um, newly uh, you know, developed kind of sources such as social media. So we get a lot of information from social media. We get a lot of information from um, uh, you know, moving. So especially depending on what, what kind of disease area that you're looking at, for example, with Alzheimer's, we might look at something uh, like variable sensors. So all of this information, all of this information, you know, all of it combined is what we call as big data within the healthcare domain. Now, in this slide, what I'm trying to show is 
although we have so much data, I, I said 100 zettabyte of data, and this was last year. Now that healthcare data is growing. Within this 100 zettabyte of data, approximately 80% of it is unstructured, which means it is not an easily readable table. It's probably an image or, uh, or some form of text. It could be a PDF file, right? That needs further processing before you can analyze the data. Another interesting fact to consider is the DATCON score that you see uh, at the bottom of the screen here. So this comes from an IDC paper that describes where life sciences industry is in terms of how efficiently it is using data to solve the problems. And not so surprisingly, the, the DATCON score of life sciences industry is below average. It's at 2.4. Now, this, uh, this was in 2020, but things haven't changed too much from then. So what that con score essentially is showing or telling us is in terms of how efficiently life sciences is using data science and AI, it's lagging behind compared to a lot of different industries, you know, hardcore tech industries, for example, are utilizing data science and AI to a much more um, efficient ex extent. So we at life sciences are still sort, you know, somewhat lagging behind. Artificial intelligence or, or the, the concept of using machines or machine learning is not new at all. And you'll see that in my next slide. There's so many applications out there and here are just a few that I list here. Now companies like Netflix or Facebook all have been using the, these various different applications to make their product you know, more efficient. For in, instance, when I log into Netflix, it shortlists the movies that it thinks I would like to watch. And that suggestion that Netflix has for me is based on my watch history. So it knows what I'm thinking. It knows what my mood is like. It knows what kind of movie I would like to watch. Now, that is a combination of a lot of these applications and, of course, much more than what you see on this screen. Like I mentioned, AI is not new at all. So this is, I'm showing about 60 years or so of, you know, gradual progression of how it, uh, AI has evolved. Now, what has happened in the span of roughly 60 plus years is that we are now able to compute very, very fast and very efficiently. We can search, analyze, understand, and learn from tremendous amount of data not ever possible before. And finally, create machines that can learn with minimal human intervention. So this, this uh, when I say minimal human intervention, I'm talking about the likes of you know, AlphaGo. Right, AlphaGo was in 2017, and now in 2021, we have AlphaFold. Now, these are some AI applications that, that are, you know, basically going towards way more machine um, dependent or machine reliable than human. Right? Of course, there has been a lot of hype as well. So there are certain cases, certain success stories that prove that AI can actually revolutionize the world. Right. But there again, there also has been hype. This plot here, we see different applications of AI and where they stand. So on the y-axis, you see we have human and machine decision-making. So the higher up we go on the y-axis, the less human input is required. So you see that one all the way up here is for generative adversarial networks, or you see the alpha go that I mentioned is right here at two. So you need very minimal uh, human intervention. You, you have a lot more of machine power that's doing most of the work, right? But when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to life sciences, we're not quite there except for alpha fold that was released, I think this year, early this year, right? But within life sciences, when we think of doing business, when we think of conducting business, we are somewhere around this. So you see the red uh, bubbles here, 17, 18, 19. Those are the risk scores, predictors, and things like that. We are still very much um, dependent on the clinical wisdom, right? We're still, we are at a... Um, Words where we are talking to both the clinicians and we are talking to technologists. So it's, it's a combination of the, the two that makes us supremely powerful. Now, computing has is one of the other pillars that I mentioned. So progress in computing, it, it's it, the, the tremendous amount of progress that we see in computing today is remarkable. 
So it has become extremely fast and efficient today. Companies like uh, Microsoft and Amazon, for example, so Microsoft has its Azure, Amazon has AWS. These are the companies that can provide the computing power. Now compute has also become extremely scalable today. So we're not restricted to the older ways of working anymore. So we now have um, systems in place that can adapt to growing computational needs. Depending on the problem you have at hand, depending on the algorithm that you need for it, you have the compute power at your disposal. Now computing is also pervasive or ubiquitous, right? So we can get compute power using microprocessors that are connected to a network and don't necessarily require a full-blown um, system to work. So things are becoming easier and easier for us to use compute, to use the powerful algorithms. And of course, we have the generous amount of data that we collect every day. Now, this is another example. So this is, um, so I took this from OpenAI. So what you see is GPT-3. So one of the recent examples of compute needs was seen with GPT-3, which is a product of OpenAI. Just to familiarize the audience uh, with GPT-3, it is a language model that uses deep learning to essentially form sentences like a human. So it has been tested as a chatbot, but of course there are uh, quite a bit of limitations to this. But what it does, it, it gives the community, the AI enthusiasts a hope. So th there are applications that can be used for the betterment of healthcare, but, you know, to help life sciences industry. Anyway, I'm digressing from the topic a little, but if you look at the plot here, you see just how much the compute needs have increased over the years. So you see this plot going from the 1960s to the 2020s, and you see an overwhelming increase in just how much compute power is required. In, in this table below, you see for GPT-3, the compute required was 3640 petaflop days. Now, just to make it clear what it means, because this took me a while to understand what it means. It means 3640, 10 to the 15 neural net operations per second every day. Now, that, that is a lot of compute that is required for something like GPT-3 that spits out text like a human. So this is just to show how much compute power uh, is required and how much compute power has progressed over the years, that we, we're actually able to do something like this. It, it just amazes me, so I'm just being very, um, sorry, I think I skipped. So next here, what we have is, so, so far we discussed the, the three pillars, right? So we discussed the big data. We discussed how much healthcare or life sciences data is growing. We discussed the powerful algorithms and how AI or the concept of AI is not new, but the application of AI within the life sciences domain needs to be you know, revolutionized. So it needs to be incorporated even more. And lastly, we also talked about the compute. That, that is the underlying force, the underlying support system that helps us you know, to incorporate all these different AI. Now the question is, how can we enable this, this AI transformation, especially within the healthcare or life sciences industry? Now there are more ways than two, but I've just listed two. And these two are what we are trying to achieve here at Novartis. For example, the first one is absolutely collaboration. And the second is, is the community. How can we build community within, you know, a community of our associates that can enable this AI transformation? Now, when I think about AI within pharma, it's a, um, it's a very simple formula, actually, if you look at it. AI in pharma is using the pharmaceutical data, proprietary, whatever, pharma, or even public data, and partnering it with necessary compute. And AI will just follow. Now, within Novartis, we have partnered with two tech giants. We have Microsoft and Amazon to empower and build AI within Novartis. Now, press releases for these went out uh, you know, early last year, so this is all public information. So we're anchoring this partnership with these tech giants to bring the expertise and the technology as well, right? The AI Innovation Lab, for example, within Novartis is the Novartis's engine and go-to place for AI. So it, it's the hub for all AI that we do. In collaboration with Microsoft, the lab aims to increase our AI capabilities internally, right? From research, uh, whether it is uh, drug discovery, commercialization, 
The aim here is to accelerate discoveries and the development of transformative medicines for patients all around the world. So that, that is just in a nutshell, that is what we are trying to do with partnering with these tech giants like Amazon and Microsoft and also increasing Novartis's, you know, empowering Novartis to reach its goal. And the next thing I mentioned was community building. How are we empowering our associates with AI? So in addition to partnering with these, you know, for compute power, we truly believe that empowering our associates with AI is, is the, the one of the main things that we can do to transform how we think, how we work. Our AI empowerment, so we have an initiative called AI Empowerment. What it does is it, the aim is to make sure that every Novartis associate has the technology that they need. So we call this, uh, it's almost like bringing AI to our associates' fingertips. So any technology that they need to analyze the, the data that they have, we make it happen. So that, that's the initiative, uh, you know, the AI empowerment. We also have a, a set on, uh, you know, we're also set on a path to make Novartis digital. So I'll give you an example. Octalia is one of our products where the purpose of Octalia is it's an AI powered digital assistant for field based associates. So MSLs, for example, right? So it's it's a tool that helps our field based associates and it provides insights about when and how to contact doctors based on their preferences. So it could be via email, phone, or it could be in person. So last year we launched a new set of uh, standards as well called the digital code. So this is open for our Novartis associates. So this is essentially gearing our associate towards using AI um, and empowering themselves in using AI and also you know, getting the most of it. So these are just a few of the of the uh, programs that we have internally for our associates to bring about that change within Novartis. Finally, I mean, if you think about it, the, the entire perception of how healthcare industry should be or how life sciences industry should be has drastically changed over the years. So how drug discovery used to be is very different from you know, how drug discovery is today. So there are a lot of startups, there are a lot of companies that focus on utilizing AI, uh, you, you know, to discover drugs. You know, Target ID, for example, it's a, it's a very huge, um, you know, process within the, the life sciences uh, chain, pharmaceutical chain. But AI, ha uh, you know, is empowering a lot of these companies, a lot of these steps uh, along the way. So I spoke about a life sciences value chain. So when I think about life sciences value chain, I'm thinking about three things, right? So first and foremost is new therapies. So when I say new therapies, I mean drug discovery, right? How are we using AI to develop new therapies? So within life sciences industry, so let, let me go back to new therapies, right? So we have, I mentioned AI Innovation Lab previously. So this is our hub, the, the brain behind how we, you know, design different molecules. How are we optimizing, you know, engineering, engineered cells, dosing, for example. And AI empowerment also is, is a part of this. So in addition to working on these various different algorithms, algorithms, various different models using AI, we're also trying to empower our uh, associates, right? Now, with the new therapies, which include you know, which includes drug discovery primarily, we also think business optimization is of utmost importance. So infusing AI in optimizing our businesses will eventually help our associates as well as our patients, right? So within life sciences industry, business optimization is also a major component. How are we optimizing our business processes using AI, right? So data, I give you an example of Data42. Now Data42 uh, is a, a hub of different various kinds of data that can be used to analyze, uh, you know, whatever it is that the scientists would like to analyze. But this is a hub where we have incorporated proprietary Novartis clinical trial data in one place. So there are about 2 million patient years of data. So there are 2 million patients and about 3,000 different clinical trial data that exists within Data42 today. Now, just bringing everything together is, is a huge enabler for what we would like to do using AI, 
right? So having that source of data at your disposal for our associates is what we are trying to use AI for. So cleaning the data, how, how are we wrangling the data? So all of these things require some form of AI. So knowledge graph, for example, we can use K42 is another uh, offshoot of data 42. So we're using knowledge graph to empower this kind of you know, business optimization. Lastly, I mean, we are a, a you know, pharmaceutical company and our primary customers are our patients, right? So we work for our patients. So what is it that, so ultimately what we want to do is we want to use AI also to reach our patients, to see how we can use this AI to reach patients. So one of the examples I provide here is AI nurse. Now what AI nurse is, does is, um, Sorry. So AI nurse is, is the first of its kind. So right now it's it's available in China, uh, not in the U.S. But AI nurse is the first of its kind in China to build a um, a digital chronic disease management model together with hospital and physician visits, which makes it possible for heart failure patients to do more self monitoring and management. So the aim here, the overall goal here is to provide a caring, convenient and extremely user friendly uh, app that, that the patients can use. So it's self monitored um, and also so the idea, the problem that we see, especially is a lot of rehospitalization. So what this AI nurse, the goal of AI nurse is essentially to reduce that rehospitalization and, and so that the patients themselves can, you know, talk to the physicians, you know, inform them about what is happening so that you don't have to get rehospitalized. So AI nurse has been a huge success, especially given this pandemic. So going to the hospital, getting admitted to the hospital is not something people look forward to. But if there is a convenient and efficient and user friendly way of communicating with your physician. Right. So th that solves a lot of problems is th that's what we have seen with AI nurse. Now, finally, this quote, I truly um, I really like this quote because it provides both um, hope and also a, a way to you know, motivate myself and others as well. So AI is today's defining technology. I mean, hype aside, there are a lot of things that can be and are being used to completely transform how we do things, how we see things, how are we discovering new drugs, how are we reaching our patients, and of course, how are we improving the the uh, you know businesses themselves right so these are some of the things that ai is enabling us to do it allows ai allows us to reimagine how we deliver healthcare and you know care to patients improve the outcomes and of course accelerate universal health coverage so there are a lot of things ai can do there are a lot of things that we have at novartis been trying to do and of course there are a lot of things we would like to do as well now after this, so th this is actually my, my um, last slide. So essentially, given that so far, just to summarize what I've said so far, we have huge influx of data. We have powerful algorithms. We have, you know, huge uh, you know, um, technical talent available because of this. And of course, we have partners like Microsoft, AWS, just to name a few. But we have all this coming together now. So given this, where, what is next for us? What are the things that we would like to see? Especially due to this pandemic, we have seen you know, even more sense of commitment to the digitization of healthcare, right? So maybe prior to pandemic, people were slightly hesitant about using certain, uh, you know, apps, for example, or a phone app that, that, you know, people could use, patients could use. But pandemic, I think, has accelerated th this idea of how we can digitize some of these things and how it's actually helping if we digitize these things. So patients are getting used to additional digital services, right? So remote patient monitoring is something we had to do, right? Pandemic, we, we cannot ask patients to come in or, or, you know, six feet distance, it's very unlikely to happen. So because of this pandemic, I think it has just given this new sense of commitment. So how can we do things differently and still, you know, be on track? Uh, I'll give you an example. So in Nigeria, this was right, you know, when the pandemic started, 
AI driven smartphone app is you know is already being used to accurately diagnose birth asphyxia so which is this is something that often goes undiagnosed or untreated but using this smartphone app they're able to do this so this is just the beginning of you know so many more wonderful things that are you know about to happen the other thing is promising advances at the intersection of tech and health like i mentioned before this is a marriage between healthcare and technological you know advancements so if you combine these two it forms the most powerful um, you know technology plus health so major advances at the intersection of tech and health is a huge what next right so scientists for example in our labs use 3d visualization to explore how different molecules might you know better fit into these these protein pockets so that that is something ai has enabled us to do the power of ai to you know analyze or or visualize data is unparalleled so how you can create these 3d models and how exactly the ligand you know binding site how it changes dynamically these are some of the things that ai can help us see right so in, in the world of medicine we know ai can better identify skin cancer so we we saw a lot of publications come out google published uh, uh i think two publications last year so we have seen a lot of these publications come out with skin cancers and lung cancers so where machines are doing a lot better than the human eye so we are digitizing our entire you know library of millions of pathology slides to explore you know new insights so in the previous you know in the olden days i mean it it just sounds funny but in the olden days we a pathologist would sit to look at the slides score the slides you know it, it used to be a very very long process but now with ai things have become easier even for the pathologists right so and lastly we're also you know hoping to use ai in r&d to improve uh, target id or to identify drug responders so dosages so these are all few things that we hope to you know do with the help of ai now last point that i have is the pandemic also has motivated a rising tide of tech talents to be interested in bringing their ambitions and skills to the work you know, in improving human health so we used to have this this um, segregation of you know tech population going towards microsoft and aws and facebook and what not and then we would have more biologists and chemists joining the pharmaceutical industry but these days we see a lot of tech talent people with computer science background joining pharmaceutical industries because again it, it's the marriage between health life sciences and technology right so we conducted a research um last year so this research conducted basically showed us that 86% of the tech talents that that we hired agree that healthcare's digital moment is right now and 72% are more attracted to the industry now than they were ever before the pandemic so pandemic really has sort of shown us the way so it has shown what digitization can do it has shown what are some of the things that can actually be done because you know it's if push comes to shove you create these new things that you have to do and i think that pandemic is has actually forced us to invent new things be innovative be creative and i think that ha- that will go a very long way so i think with that uh, i would like to say thank you um and please you know leave any questions please ask any questions you have and i'll try my level best to you know answer wonderful thank you again shruti for your amazing presentation like you said um ai is here to stay it's progressively getting better as time moves on and um if there's any questions for dr shruti from the audience you can type it on the right hand side and dr dust if you have any remarks or questions feel free Great talk, Shruti. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. So, I guess we'll be heading to our final keynote presentation before the uh, panel discussion. So, Dr. Das, if we can just head over there. Um, and uh, again, I want to thank uh, Shruti for her great talk. Thank you.